Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we're here at Bishop Museum, ready to converse with the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for joining us on Island Focus. This building is the symbol of Bishop Museum. It is. This is Hawaiian Hall, and we really think that this is the iconic symbol that most people think of when you say Bishop Museum. And where we're standing in front of is the first part of Hawaiian Hall, which opened in 1891 to the public. Hmm. Hawaiian Hall looks like one big building, but it's actually three separate buildings that were built connecting to each other over a period of about 10 years. The exterior of Hawaiian Hall is stone which was quarried right here on the grounds and formed and shaped here by workmen and then built, used to build these buildings. And in addition to these historic structures, we've also got newer structures. We've got the Science Learning Center and of course we've nice. got the planetarium. So in addition to the old buildings and the beautiful stonework and the stories that are inside those buildings, we're also telling newer stories and we're telling things with newer technologies. So we're covering all different things for Hawaii in the Pacific and we are telling these stories for people of all different ages, including a lot of things for families. So And the old and the new merging together. There you go, that's exactly <laughs> right. I'm here with Nate Yotoku of the organization called KUPU. That's a really interesting acronym. <laughs> what does it stand for? Thanks for having us. KUPU uh, in Hawaii means to grow, to sprout. And at our organization, we work on youth engagement with um, young adults 17 to 26, giving them opportunities to, to grow and to, to learn while doing some work. And you're the director of sustainability. Correct, yes. What does that mean? That's a tough question. Um, for me personally, sustainability means taking care of our, our planet, our island, and all of our resources. It's a, it's a wide view, but it's a, it's a holistic view of, of just being able to take care of the aina. Now that's the technical term, and theoretically and spiritually we understand that. Uh, the term has been misused or reused in different ways. Mm -hmm. But I think you're, you're working with young people to clarify what it really means. Absolutely. So what we do best is we give them hands-on learning opportunities through doing work. So we actually try to partner them with um, job opportunities where they, can, where they can spend time and learn by actually doing field work or working in an industry. And I think through that, the youth have the opportunity to kind of form their idea of what sustainability is and how they can personally impact our state's efforts. So when you speak about youth, what ages are we talking about? And it sounds like they're doing more than just volunteering. Correct. Um, we, we have about 300 members every year. Uh, we've been doing this for about 10 years, so roughly 3,000 members through Kupu. And, and they're typically ages 17 to 26. And they're, um, we partner with different community companies and organizations, state, local, federal government. And we put them in opportunities to actually get paid while they learn. The connection to get the students to be, or I guess the young people, to be members. That's an interesting concept, to belong to something. Yes, and, and we feel it is a, a membership. It's, it's like we're building a community of like-minded young people that, that want to take care of the, the aina and to, to grow and to learn. And, and we recruit from various places like high schools, colleges, uh, word of mouth, social media. Your website. Correct, they can, website. they can yes. apply yeah, to apply to our website, yes. Uh, what's a project that's going on right now that you're particularly, um, I guess, enthusiastic about? Well, one new project that we're launching in 2018 is called the Pacific Resiliency Fellowship. And it's a project that's come from uh, IUCN and the World Conservation Congress in 2016. And what we're looking to do is engage about 10 to 12 early professional, early career professionals in conservation and sustainability from Palau, America Samoa, Hawaii, Guam, and Rapa Nui. And so they'd be coming to Hawaii to work? Yes, so we're gonna bring them all to Hawaii and give them some tools and some resources so that they can become better leaders for their own communities when they return. Now, I know that's serious work that you're doing, but it also sounds like it's really a lot of fun. Absolutely fun. <laughs> um, there's nothing like getting in touch with 
that I know, like getting your hands dirty. And that's a big part of what we do. We believe that our, our members and even our staff need to get out there and, and get in the lo'i and get dirty or, or go out and clear a trail or plant some trees. So we do all of that. So. I love to see photographs that you, know, that, you, that you folks post with people smiling. Yes. And they're not posed, you no. know? It's like there's lots of laughter and joy. Yeah. And if you follow like, our social accounts on Instagram and on Facebook, you'll see a lot of our, our pictures from our participants. We, we try to post a lot of their pictures, and they're having a great time. And, and they're, the best part is they're actually doing work. There's an impact for the community while they're learning at the same time. And the learning, it seems to me, from what you just said, too, prepares them for a career. Yes. So what we do, a lot of our jobs are entryways and pathways into career employment. Some of the youth that participate with us, they, don't, they love nature. They love to be either in the ocean or in the, in the forest, but they're not able to see a, a career pathway from that. And mm -hmm. what we do is we show them opportunities and, and show them that there are ways that they can be in nature and still get paid to do it. Wouldn't that be unique if we could really have young people going into careers that they loved? Yes, absolutely. And get paid? Yes. Uh, one quick parting thought. Uh, you, one thing that we love to do, again, we, we love to learn, learn by doing. So we encourage everyone. And for us, we feel like we, we, we're able to help the whole state and the whole community by, by getting our youth involved. And hopefully, as they get older, they become the stewards for them. I know. Well, I wish this program was around when I was that age. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Thank you for having us. You've been listening to a conversation with Nate Yotoku of Kupu. Thank you for joining me in my conversation with Jerry Chong, who is the president of the Ronald McDonald House of Hawaii. What a wonderful distinction you have in that role. You know, I am the one who is really, really privileged. Um, I've been there now for, for 17 years, and it seems like it was only yesterday. It's, um, it's a terrific and very gratifying place to be. So we know about Mac McDonald's. Yes. Uh, and we have heard about Ronald McDonald House. Uh -huh. So maybe tell us a little bit more about what really happens in that house. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, what we do, what the Ronald McDonald House does is we provide lodging, a place to stay, support services for very, very sick children and their families who have to come to Oahu for medical treatment that is not available where they live. A lot of people think that uh, most of the people, 90% of the children and the families who stay at the house are from the neighbor islands. And two misconceptions. Uh, first of all, not everybody in Hawaii has relatives, families, um, auntie, uncle on Oahu that they can stay with when their child is sick. So many, many, many times, all the people who stay at the house they don't have that support network to stay with. Is one of the qualifications to be from neighbor islands or from a distance? One of the major qualifications is you cannot be uh, a resident of Oahu. Mm. So the majority of people and families come from the neighbor islands, but we also have families um, from the Pacific Islands, Guam, Micronesia, um, those places that do not have uh, pediatric hospitals. And we have families who are traveling from the mainland, from out of the country, they're visiting Hawaii, and an accident happens, or the child goes through a medical crisis, or a mom goes into very, very early premature labor. And the only option is to get hospitalized or to receive care here, and they end up at the Ronald McDonald House. You've used the word family very often, and I gather that that's part of the um, characteristic of the Ronald McDonald House. Yes, yes. The families who stay at the house, what is so important to them, yes, they need the day-to-day -day basics when they get here, um, but what is the most important thing that they really need is the compassion, is the care, is that network of support, people to lean on, and the staff the volunteers and the other families. What the other families, what the families provide to each other is the most important thing for everybody who's staying at the house. It really is a healing that takes place. Within the traumatic time yes. that the families are there, 
uh, there must be a lot of joy as well. You know, there really is. Um, if you were to walk into the Ronald McDonald House, you will see a lot of children. The sick children, they are hospitalized when they are receiving uh, treatments like radiation and chemotherapy or surgery. But then they are discharged and their recovery or while they're waiting for further treatments, they're, in, they're on Oahu and they are the ones who stay at the Ronald McDonald House. Children are children, even if they are sick. You walk into the house, you see the kids, they are happy, they are smiling. You hear the laughter. There's nothing like walking into a room and having a child laugh. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and smile. That's it right. must be very rewarding for you. And how do you keep yourself in positive spirits? You know, it's, it's really because of the families. It's all about the families. The Ronald McDonald House, it, it's not a hospital, it's not a medical facility. It's a home. It's a home away from home. So when I'm there, it's like I'm at home. My office is open. I have kids running into my office all the time. Um, I'm in my office and I smell, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner <laughs> Because there's made. communal cooking as well. It is communal yeah. cooking. Uh, they can cook on their own, um, but they eat together. They eat together in the, um, in the dining room, the living room. They're all in the living room all the time. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you to invite me to dinner sometime. Oh, anytime. <laughs> Come on over. We've been chatting with Jerry Chong who is the president of the Ronald McDonald House of Hawaii. I'm here with DeSoto Brown, who is the historian at Bishop Museum. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. And you're hosting us today. And we are hosting you <laughs> in the castle building here at Bishop Museum. Thank you so much. You know, in, in walking into this building, I recall so many exhibits that you've had in the past. I bet you do, and that's one of the things that I want to get across to people is that Lots of people have memories of Bishop Museum, the fourth grade visit. It's not always the same every time you come because we've always got different things going on here. So you'll see things you remember, but you're going to always see new things too because we've got changing exhibits. And as a historian, history is about change. History is about change. History is about the things we're always doing all the time. And history encompasses not only the cultural history of humans, but it also encompasses natural history, which is the natural world. Bishop Museum's collections encompass both natural and cultural history. We have exhibits in various different buildings that are human history, natural history. We've got the Science Learning Center. We have the Hawaiian Hall Complex. Uh, the planetarium. In the Planetarium. And in the Long Gallery, which is our change exhibit area, we are just about to open something called Hola Moana runs from November of 2017 to June of 2018, which is about long distance voyaging in the Pacific. So we're gonna be focusing on the Hokulea, but we're gonna talk about its Malama Honua voyage, which took three years. And we talk about uh, voyaging in general and how people got throughout the entire Pacific. And, and the metaphor of voyaging in our lives. Absolutely, because we're all on voyages. People are moving around the world all the time. That's what people did throughout the Pacific, and that's what we're going to be talking about with people. And it isn't just that exhibit, because we have an entire Pacific Hall, which addresses people throughout the entire Pacific, the different cultures, how they got there, all of those variations. We've got a lot going on here. It's exciting. Well, it is exciting, and especially for a child who grew up with museums, yes. myself. Yes, yes, yes. Um, in, in this day and age, it troubles me that it's easy to read about museums on, on the Internet. The experience of being Correct. is different. Now, you know what is good, though? The Internet allows people to experience something of a museum, but it also allows people to plan where to come to. And you can visit bishopmuseum.org to be able to figure out what do I want to do when I get there, when are they open, what are their prices. That is a way to bring more people in. So in a way, it's a big help. It doesn't take the place of actually coming and visiting, though. So when they come to Bishop Museum with all of these options and all these places to go, um, what would they do? Was it an hour event? Oh, or? you have so many things to do. <laughs> We've got a planetarium that has shows throughout the day. We have a restaurant on site, Highway Inn, so you can spend the whole day. We have the Science Center. We have a Hawaiian Hall Complex, which is a variety of different things, which we will be talking about a little later in the program. 
We have our grounds. We've got, there's a lot to see and do here. We cover a lot of things for families, for younger people, for older people, for visitors, for local residents. There's something for everybody here. I like the idea that a museum is a living place. It is a living place. And it is the people who work here, the people who carry on the traditions, the people who take care of the collections, they are what make the museum live. And what I really like is, I've been here 30 years now, and I'm aware that I have my time here, but after I'm gone, others will carry it on. So Bishop Museum will continue to be here. It will continue to be telling these stories of the Pacific and Hawaii. And we like to say that we are inspiring people. Mm -hmm and we're going to care for the collections. We're going to continue to teach people, reach out to people, tell our stories. Well, I look forward to hearing a little bit more and seeing more about the museum and at the I end look of our forward program. to telling you about it too. <laughs> thank you for being with us right You're now. You're welcome. Thank you. We've been chatting with DeSoto Brown, historian at the Bishop Museum. Appreciate you being with us. fabulous building this is. This is Hawaiian Hall and I think this is what most people think of as Bishop Museum. Mm -hmm. It was constructed in 1900. It was open to the public in 1903 after the entire interior was finished. And we like to think that this is our largest collection artifact or object because it's an irreplaceable, unique, historic building. So not only do you look around at the architecture of this space and see how beautiful it is and how amazing it is just to be in here, but the exhibits are second to none. They tell the story of Hawaii. They tell all different types of aspects of Hawaiian culture, traditional Hawaiian culture throughout the ages. Each floor has a different theme. And we've got, in addition to all of the refurbishment that got done here, <laughs> The whale and the halepili are the old friends that are still here that everybody remembers from when they came here as a kid. Well, there's literature and art and graphic art. I mean, Absolutely. it's just filled with so and much. And it isn't, it isn't just the historic Hawaiian culture. It's coming up to today, too. It's yeah. the things that have carried on in Hawaiian culture that we're still teaching people about, that we're still imparting to people today. It's a culture that has a past, and it's a culture that has a present. And it's real. And it certainly is real, and this is the preeminent place to come and learn about it. I'm here at Bishop Museum with Sherry Chang, who is the CEO of the Girl Scouts of Hawaii. What a wonderful role you have in this world. It's really a great opportunity, and I love working with the girls and being able to help mentor and, and develop them into the future leaders of, of our communities. And I know the Girl Scouts have many different images, but um, you know, the way you're dress today sure seems that uh, Girl Scout is becoming more contemporary. It is, although this um, today I'm wearing a scarf that is in celebration of our 100th anniversary this year. Uh, this was designed by Sig Zane, an exclusive design uh, to honor Queen Liliuokalani, who actually sponsored Troops 1 and 2 in Hawaii in 1917. I had no idea that we had been there so long. I, <laughs> I was a Girl Scout and I think you were too. Right, yes I was, yes. Uh, my family, I was actually, uh, we had four generations of Girl Scouts. Our fifth generation just started with my granddaughter. So we uh, felt scouting was a great way to make friends. Uh, I, we traveled our family around the world and it was a great way to meet new people. And now uh, you have your granddaughter yes. in, in scouting. With all of the priority on technology and uh, you know contemporary subjects, how is Girl Scouting relevant? Well, one of the things that we do in today's world, Girl Scouts changed uh, pretty radically about 10 years ago. It's girl-led now, so the girls really have a lot of input and say in what we focus in on. Right now, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is a great importance, but so is the outdoor experience program, because we need to get the girls away from technology sometimes to learn different sets of leadership skills, and, and the camp experience does that. But it also, the research shows, makes them better environmental advocates in the future as well. You know, one of the things I remember about scouting, besides the camping, um, is that there's all these opportunities to learn new things. Well, even something as simple as the cookie program, people think that the girls just go out and sell cookies, but it's a full entrepreneurship and financial literacy program. They have to learn five business skills. We bring in some of the top women leaders in town to Cookie University, and they learn everything <laughs> from goal setting to uh, customer service to community, how to give back to the community, things like that. So each of the programs has their own different distinct uh, um, set of opportunities for the girls to learn leadership skills. That's fascinating. And when you talk about leadership, what does that mean relative to the Girl Scouts? 
Well, one of the things I think many of us feel is there's a leadership void you know, in our society today. And if we don't start developing young children to have these proper leadership skills for the future, then we won't necessarily have good leaders in the future. And so you want to make sure that they have good skills, good character, a good understanding, uh, communication, community service driven, things like that. And that's what Girl Scouts is all about. And, and I would sense too that in that learning about leadership, it's also enjoying who they are becoming and who they are. Right. And having joy. I mean, right. I, I look at the Girl Scouts in their uniforms now when I pass them and they're so happy. That's part of the girl-led experience is you want to have fun. It's hands-on cooperative learning, but you have fun while you're doing it. And you're doing it in a safe all-girl environment. So you don't have any of the hang-ups of, oh, so-and-so is watching me or anything. You really have a chance to just kind of become your fulfill your own self and that's what it's all about and how wonderful to help girls be comfortable with girls right right and with other women right and that's we actually even have videos on that to show them what happens in business for girls who are women young women who haven't gone through the girl scout experience and how they may relate to other women in, in the workplace because we want them to learn to be supportive of other females and to be understanding of what some of the issues are you know, you're not only very articulate with what Girl Scouts are, I know that you're, the joy is very natural for you to be yes. part of this. <laughs> it is. I, you know, I think just watching what you can help achieve with the girls, and we have an after-school leadership program where we actually bring in girls from Title I schools and under-resourced areas. We put troops in places like the Boys and Girls Club in Nana Cooley and Waianae because we really believe that all girls should have the opportunity to enjoy the Girl Scout experience. Thank you so much for taking the time and for being with us and sharing the, the 100th anniversary. Thank and you very much. That's pledge. right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been chatting with Sherry Chang, uh, CEO of the Girl Scouts of Hawaii. We're here at Bishop Museum conversing with Representative Jared Keoho Kalole. And uh, you're in the House of Representatives. Yes. That's a handful, isn't it? It is. It's been a big learning process, but I enjoy it. I've learned a lot. It's good. What uh, is your district? It's Kaneohe, parts of Kaneohe, and then Kahalu'u, all the way out to Waihole. So that's country for those of us who live in the city. Uh, and it must be an interesting experience coming with that background and also your mainland education. Yeah, I grew up in Kaneohe. My whole family's from Kaneohe. They've been there a long, long time. And uh, my wife and I, she's from Kaneohe too. We went away for school. And then when we had our kids, we came home. So we wanted to raise them in Kaneohe. Well, congratulations for coming home and best wishes. Yeah, so being in the House of Representatives is a new career field for you. Yeah. Yeah, I went to law school and uh, at the University of Hawaii and got interested in policy. And when I look at what's going on in Kaneohe, what's going on in the state, you know, I think we need, to, we need to figure a lot of things out. We have a lot of problems that have been ignored for a long time. And so one of them is jobs, and that's why I started working in, in innovation. Now, I know you have some dreams. Yeah. What might they be? Well, I think we have to figure out a way to help local people get better paying jobs. We have these problems with the cost of living, with housing. And so one of the ways we can uh, sort of help people deal with it is finding better high paying jobs that solve some of the problems that we have in Hawaii so we can be a little more self-sustainable. Not only finding them, but we have to create them. Yeah, and, and part of it is to solve the problems that we're seeing right now with technology. I mean, I, I'm thinking about 15 years from now. Uh, what is the economy going to look like? What kind of jobs are going to be available and are not available? We don't have travel agents anymore for the, for the most part because of online bookings. But are we going to have cashiers? Are we going to have truck drivers you know, with autonomous vehicles? So, well, and, and I've read recently, are we going to have books? You know, are we even right. going to have checkbooks? I mean, we're moving at such a rapid pace to put things out of our hands. How do you deal with that reality because the laws and the legislature is in your hands? Part of it is we need to work better to collaborate with people in the business community, but also in our education system, just to get people focused on the fact that everything is changing really fast and we need to figure out ways to adapt that. I think we need to be more entrepreneurial when it comes to um, the type of businesses that we're trying to foster and develop in Hawaii. We can't just rely on tourism and military forever. Or construction. 
that's, that's right. The third, that's the third branch, right? That's right. But we don't necessarily have to be like everywhere else on the mainland. We have lots of resources in Hawaii that we've relied on for a long time. And it's just figuring out innovative ways to use what we have and, and figure it out ourselves. That's, that's how pineapple and the sugar industries you know, came about was because we figured out innovative ways to corner the market. And I think we still have the ability to do that. We just got to try. And that's also why pineapple and sugar cane left. Well, that's right. And so, you know, you can't fix a problem if you don't try. And so part of this effort is working with the school system to develop more capability for kids to do things like coding and, and get involved in technology and working with the university to make sure that we're capitalizing on a lot of the research and things that they do that the taxpayers pay for. You know, the credit card system, Aloha EDC, which is the, the system that everybody in the stores uses, mm. was invented in Hawaii and the company mm. moved away. So the technology and, and all the innovative things that are happening in Hawaii, we need to work better to make sure that we're building those out in Hawaii. So if I were to ask you, because Kaneohe is very important sure. and near and dear to your heart, uh, one word or a couple of words that describe what Kaneohe means to you or what it is. Home. <laughs> yeah. And I think the community in Kaneohe is still full of a lot of longtime local families who have seen a lot of change in Hawaii and it's getting more expensive and crowded, but everybody still wants to live there and raise their kids there. So they need good jobs to be able to afford it. Well, thank you for coming home and for reminding us how important home is. Thank you thank very you. much. We're here at Bishop Museum conversing with Representative Jared Kaohe Kalole. Thank you for being with us today. Like every place in Bishop Museum, this is also special. This is very special. It used to be called Polynesian Hall. It's now called Pacific Hall. We're telling the story of the entire Pacific in this exhibit space. And this also, as the rest of Hawaiian Hall, was restored and refurbished. Um, we installed this wonderful floor map that we're walking yeah, on fabulous. right now, which is a map of the Pacific Ocean that shows you the places we're talking about. These are cultures throughout the Pacific. We're talking about the cultures, that we're talking about how the people got to these different places because they journeyed throughout the Pacific. It's part of the, the same stuff that we're talking about in our Hola Moana exhibit. Uh, this is larger than that and discussing it in greater detail. And the metaphor and the concept of voyaging. Yes, yes, exactly, because we have physical voyaging and we have voyaging in other types of ways, spiritual ways, and the ways that people are connected in the Pacific, the ways that people are unique in the Pacific. That's what we're talking about here at Pacific Hall. Mahalo to Bishop Museum for hosting us and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and Malama Pono. Take care of each other. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs>